the agenda for this morning's um, at an hour at the most. If we're talking about advantages, challenges, how to overcome the challenges, myths of online learning. And then we're going to take a quick look at actually some of the platforms you'll be using Outlook, Blackboard, Teams, the URSLC app, and then turn it in and safe assign are sort of embedded into Blackboard and are ways that you can um, that we use to have students submit assignments. Um, and then we'll answer your questions. In the meantime, please feel free to jump on the chat anytime. Michelle will let me know if there's a question. So the advantages to online learning are probably what some of you are experiencing this morning. I don't know if you're still in your bed or somewhere quiet in a corner of your house or at a park, coffee shop, but you can learn whenever, wherever, however works for you. And a lot of people really appreciate that because in addition to that, we have a lot of work and family commitments. And, and so there's a possibility for you to kind of balance all of that out and make the learning work for you. The hard part about that is what style of learning works for you. I think some of us think we know what what works for us, but it's going to take a little bit of trial and error as a lot of us have experienced in working um, in the office versus working at home. It also actually allows for more interaction and a greater ability to concentrate. So obviously if it's just you and you know, you're not surrounded by 40 or 50 or hundreds of other students in one classroom with one teacher, you're able to concentrate a lot more in terms of, you know, doing research and readings and the interaction is sort of what we experienced this morning. How many of you have said hello? Talk to us about your program, given us, you know, where are you from, what time zone it might be. And I 100% would not have had that same experience sitting with first years in a classroom. It would have been crickets. I would have had to have been literally saying, how about you and having and really pulling the information from you. So it's really, you know, it, it can be actually a, a lot more interaction. It'll improve your technical skills, whether you know it or not, you have to just jump in and figure out the technical piece of online learning. And as I experienced this morning, the challenge of having my computer completely freeze when I'm five minutes into a workshop and, and what that looks like and how to figure that out. Um, I mentioned there's you know five platforms we're gonna talk about today. Some of you might have logged into one or two of them. Maybe you've heard of them. Maybe all five are brand new to you. You could be thinking, how in the heck am I going to ma manage all this? You will. If any of you have Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, you know, all those social media platforms, online banking, if you shop on Amazon, um, you already have some of these skills and you've already figured out how to, you know, work them. And then let's be real. I know today's not, um, would you know the what Canadians envision when we talk about weather but uh, I really don't love the winter commute uh, brushing off our cars scraping off the ice finding all our mitts and hats um, walking from one room to the next with your cup of coffee it actually doesn't seem too bad so that too is, is a real big advantage however with that being said there are some challenges that will come with online learning Adapting to online learning will be a big one. And, and that's just the transition from what you're maybe used to with a traditional classroom, or if you have worked in a traditional office and you're now working from home, there's a period of time where you're going to have to transition and adapt to what that looks like for you. And it, it, is, it is just different, right? Change is hard and we all kind of know what we know. If any of you have taken one online course you might already kind of have a sense of how you feel about it when maybe now doing four or six online courses at the same time um, could could be very different technical issues so this is more you know what are you going to be using when it comes to online learning are you do you have a desktop computer a laptop um, maybe you're thinking about using something more mobile It'll be tough if you do. You, you really do need a laptop at minimal. And if not, you need to, you know, build up a little bit if possible in terms of maybe a keyboard and a mouse and a, a proper setup of, you know, your workstation. 
we, we're going to talk a little bit about workstations and in terms of how that ties into self-motivation and, and time management. But the technical issues can really hold you back. And so you've got about a month now before classes start to organize yourself when it comes to the, the technical part of it. Um, you know, log on to these different things using the devices that you think you're going to use and see what it looks like. How does that work for you? Um, you know, if you have a workstation, set it up. Are you missing plugs? Is there an outlet? You know, you don't want your computer dying halfway through maybe a presentation. So all of those little things, lighting, for example, uh, it takes a little bit of time. So this is the time for you to explore that because all these little things will help you be more successful when classes begin. Computer literacy. So going back to that comment I made earlier, um, it, it really is, you know, what you make of it. Just take your time and try not to get overwhelmed. You know, I wouldn't say spend the next three days diving in hour after hour to all these different platforms pick and choose one and today I'm going to show you just like a couple of things in each of them that I think are important to get you kind of jump started for the fall and your classes and courses and instructors are going to also talk to you about how to be successful within their course you're going to actually learn about writing emails but if you can have a little bit of knowledge about that now then it, it'll help you the more you can kind of prepare the better success you will have and I think just keep in mind, we're all doing this together. We, this is, you know, a really like unprecedented times, um, typically not the normal way we work. And so it's it's important just to remember that this will be the first time for, for everybody kind of on both sides of the screen. I feel that one of the biggest difficulties with online learning is time management and self-motivation. It, when you have to get up and go to a class, when you have a schedule saying from 8.30 to 10.30 and 2 to 4, you're to be in this room, there's, there's no reason not to be. But when you have a lesson that you have the week to do and it's due on Friday, it's all up to you to figure out when and how you're going to do that and meet the deadline. In addition, everyone's situations are different. Um, kids, work um you know depending on you know where you're, you're where you're living you might not have that you know space and time if you're sharing computers so again you might want to think about what that looks like and there's so many different tools your calendar on your phone if that's what you're used to an online calendar or you know paper to pen agenda you need to figure out what you prefer and amalgamate everything into one so that you're actually putting in, you know, when when do you have appointments? When do you work? When is family time? When are you going to study? When do you have a test? And that will help you really balance out what your your days and weeks look like. You'll also want to look ahead and make sure that you see what weeks have more tests than others or what weeks are heavy in assignments and that you might adjust your work schedule and that will really set you up ahead of time don't wait until the second or third week of school get that situated now so that as you get your syllabus you can actually go through it and mark in all the due dates self-motivation that's one that i can't teach you you're gonna have to figure that all out on your own um that might mean something routine is a big one getting up in the morning getting dressed as you would if you were going to be going to school going to classes uh, maybe it's your favorite mug favorite coffee the workstation you got to figure that out and you know a little bit comes back to kind of who you are and what you prefer um, a student recently explained to me a theory um, a technique sorry that is scheduling 90 minutes of work time and 15 minutes for break and repeating that schedule and i've been using that myself i've actually set a google desktop timer for 90 minutes and it's focusing on project work so it's not it's it's eliminating your phone eliminating social media websites or youtube and it's getting you to focus on what work is needed to be done within that 90 minutes and I thought I find it I, I found it very motivating. I found the 90 minutes went by faster than I had imagined. 
and I was able to focus and get a lot more productive work done than the distractions. Um, you know, even email can be something that you might not include in that 90 minutes because you can get a little lost in, you know, responding to emails. So self-motivation is one that, again, you know, there's no magic answer for that. It's a bit of trial and error. You're going to have better days than others, but it's figuring out what works for you. So some of the myths that I've either heard or thought myself um, or through some research were that online classes aren't as effective as in class. And the one thing about online classes is it isn't just taking what we would have done in the classroom and plunking ourselves in front of a screen and doing the same thing. Our faculty are working very hard to take their courses and transition them to be online. So online classes are actually just as effective in terms of there's still all the options to collaborate. You'll still be able to have all the discussions. Um, some people will really find that it actually suits their situation maybe better than the traditional classroom. And you know, for first year students, it might be a nice kind of easy transition into school. The other part is that they're easier than traditional classes. And, and that I would actually say is really truly you know not the case um again it comes back to preference some people find that they just like it more which is maybe why they think it's easier but again it's it's really a mindset and so it's it's kind of you know individual preferences but again there's you're gonna have your we have a course and we have a rubric and there's goals within the course and it doesn't matter if it's online or in class you are still going to have the same outcome I really do like this tip Emily put up in the chat about putting your phone in a drawer, out of sight, out of mind. That is 100% um, true. I've done that where I've left it just in another room by mistake, and it's an hour later that I have remembered that it's there. Another myth is about how easy it is to possibly cheat with online courses. And again, we have lots of tools to um, use when it comes to testing so that you know you you do have to do the same type of work and research and studying that you would in in class and there's also the same opportunity to interact with your faculty and classmates so again perfect example of everyone this morning chatting on the chat very easily you know maybe you would have if you were in person maybe you wouldn't have and so there's lots of options for discussions and I'm going to show you a small video about using discussions in Blackboard. And then revisiting the whole computer skills. So we talked a little bit about that in the challenges. And again, you know, you might find that you're a bit rusty. Maybe this is sort of new to you. You didn't think that you're going to have to be learning through a computer. You knew you would have to use one for your research and assignments, but actual learning on one might be a bit different. And so you know, you don't have to have expert computer skills. You don't need to know coding and all of those, you know, IT things. You do need to know when to ask for help. And you do need to think about Google. And as many years as I've been in my career, I was Googling things yesterday about PowerPoint. Things that I have done in the past, but forgot how to do them. And so I always tell students I'm working with, remember there's probably a, an easier way. You know, you're doing a lot of manual stuff when it comes to maybe Excel or Word and these platforms have so many features. So yes, handy dandy Google. <laughs> Any questions about the advantages, challenges, overcoming them? If you have your own tips, please stick them in the chat. That would be amazing to share with other students who are probably wondering some of the same things. Okay, we're going to move on to look at the actual online classroom and these topics are, you know, ones that you're obviously going to be using when it comes to learning online, but faculty have also said that we would really, they really wanted you to have a little bit of an overview about these specific platforms. So we're going to start with Outlook. <clears throat> and I'm just going to um, open my Outlook and actually show you. It'll just take me a second because remember my whole computer shut down. Okay. 
Michelle, can you see my email? Is that a yes, Michelle? I think you're on mute. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I hope all of you have had a chance to log into your Outlook. If you haven't, I have a little bit of a challenge for you um, that you log in over the weekend, whether you have or haven't, and you send an email to the business careers email, which Michelle will put in the chat for you. And I want you just to say hello. Maybe let us know what a goal you have for the semester, or if there's a question you have from today's workshop, or if you have some feedback, something you learned that you didn't know. And uh, we will respond to everybody within if you sent it to us by Monday. So we using the tips I'm going to give you right now, there'll be a couple of things I'm looking for in that email to me. So the first thing I want to to help you with is log into your email. I can't tell you how many students don't log into their email. They wait and wait and wait and they miss so much valuable information as well as they then all of a sudden have not just 10 email to sort through. They've got hundreds and thousands of emails. And right now you probably have a, a number of emails in, in your inbox and there's probably some that you can delete. There's probably some that don't apply to you. Um, there might be some that might apply to you. And, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to work with that. So here we have uh, one of our, our inboxes. And the best way to deal with your inbox is create categories. And, and what you want to do is commit, you know, maybe an hour in the morning or an hour in the afternoon to logging into your email, sorting through your emails, responding to emails. I wouldn't be checking it all day long. That, that's not a productive use of your time. Committing to when you're going to email, um, you know, unless you're waiting for a response on something particular, but it's really easy. You right click on your inbox and create a new folder. And so, you know, I've got an email here from my communications teacher. So I'm going to create a folder for my communications course, and then I'm going to drag and drop that in there. Because the email was information about the course. I don't want to delete it. I might need it. And now I know where to find it. And then I've got one about math. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to create a Math 35 folder, right click on inbox, and then you're going to drag and drop that into your inbox. This is really helpful for when you need to go and learn about uh, or go back and search your email. OK, you will have thousands of emails by the time, you know, the last end of the semester. And Michelle's nodding her head as she's experienced this. Yes, um, it's good to, um, to, to keep, keep folders and keeping everything organized so that you know if you're looking for something to go back to it was in this course then you can go to that course type of a thing in your folders yes absolutely the other thing i find students aren't aware of is when you create a new email there's three categories of sending an email so you've got two cc and if you click on two you can find all of the students and faculty in the college. So if you were to want to send to me, you're going to type in Amanda. Oh, I thought her last name started with an H. OK. Oh, career services. There she is. How do I want to talk to her? Is this message directly to Amanda? I'm going to put it in here. If it's a message to Amanda, but you know what? I actually want to let Michelle know I've emailed Amanda. So that's when you put it in the CC. That's the carbon copy. So Michelle gets that email, but she's not in the two line. So she knows that she's just copied on the email for information. If you're sending to personal emails, you're going to put it in this one, the BCC, which is blind carbon copy. If you are sending emails to a number of people, you're going to put it in the blind carbon copy. This will prevent people from replying all. And nothing worse than getting a whole bunch of reply all. So example, our hairstyling program sends an email out with a $5 haircut deal on Friday. They do not blind carbon copy and we get all these reply all saying, oh, I haven't had my hair cut in five years. I would like 10 o'clock. I'm not available Friday. Are you open Saturday? <laughs> Just 
you know, unnecessary email. And of course, we're all working really hard to manage our email. And so we don't want that. So the blind carbon copy is how I've been emailing you all summer because I'm emailing you to your personal emails. Michelle doesn't want you seeing her personal email. I don't want you to see my personal email. So it's blind carbon copy. Really important. Subject line may sound simple, but if you can make a very um, specific subject line about what your question is, it, it's really helpful for us if, in terms of if we have a lot of emails to respond to of how we prioritize. OK, if I know that you're you know, looking for something and it's sort of more immediate, you can also even high importance the, the uh, message by clicking on this, but only do that if it's really something urgent. OK, so subject line. Final thing before we move out of email is the signature. And this is like most important. Even though it tells me what email you are emailing me from, there are a million students with the same name. And I don't know what program you're in. I don't know when you started the program. So the first thing I want you to do when you open up, you have to go into a new email, is go to signature, click on signatures, and you're going to create a new signature. So you're going to call this one professional, for example. OK. And then you're going to type in here your name, your program, your student number, your email, possibly your phone number. It could even include your LinkedIn. Is it is everyone else hearing OK? Jasmine just said it was a bit unclear. I wonder if it's just the connection with Jasmine. Let me know if everyone else can hear OK. I'm hearing OK. OK. And so you want to make sure that this is set up so that it's. Letting the person know who you're emailing, who you are in a quick way. You also can include like you'll see here. I've got Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. They're not my personal ones. They are my um, the school of business ones because I do want people to have access to those. If you don't have a professional Facebook account, do not put the link in your email. OK, LinkedIn is the one if you if you don't know what LinkedIn is. It's a professional network that you could also spend some time on this summer starting um, to create. And there is a course where, you're, where you will earn marks for that. So it's, it's definitely a good use of time. Before you finish out your signature, you want to make sure that up here you have it where it applies to new messages. And I suggest that it is on replies and forwards as well. So you would select professional, select professional, click OK. When you go to make a new email, it's it's going to populate right away for you. You don't have to worry about putting your name in there. You're just going to write your message. One other word of advice, the way you text is not how you email. So that is a transition I see with many students in the beginning, and it's just habits that we have where we short form things or we write hey, where we need to write hello, Amanda, hi, Amanda, you know, thank you and, and, and be clear about what our messages are. Um, just to avoid us having to ask questions about your questions. So that is my couple of tips on email. There is a calendar option, which I'm quickly going to show you, which didn't. Oh, uh, let me close that. So the calendar option will show you what your week looks like. You can also view it by day, by month whatever preference you have. And this is how we book meetings with you typically. So if you can keep this up to date, then we will book things with you when you have availability. We will send you a meeting request and there's a way to respond. There's a little checkbox or an X that you can accept the meeting. That way it goes into your calendar, goes into my calendar. At the top when you do a new meeting, so you just double click on the day. So September 8th, I want to make a meeting. Um, you can choose if you want a reminder. So if you have a project that week, but you don't really want to, you know, it, it's not a, an actual uh, appointment, you might choose to set it just as a reminder. So you can choose all these different options for what it looked like in your calendar. You can choose, you know, if you want it to remind you the day before or just 10 minutes before private makes it so that I can't see what the actual meeting is. It just shows me that you have a time on your calendar 
that's blocked. The other piece is blocking out times that you don't want people to meet with you. So it could be, you know, from nine to 10 every day is when you're doing your email or studying, or, you know, you're the morning person, so you wanna get your research in, or it maybe it's from three to four, or you wanna work out on your lunch every day, so you're scheduling that in. On that note, you should really look at um, school as your full-time job. So this is, you know, you're a business professional now, treat school as if it was a, a full-time sort of, you know, eight to four job and schedule your day accordingly. So it still leaves your evenings and weekends free. You should be able to do all of your work within that time period. If you manage it properly, you should be able to have the evenings and weekends free where you can, you know, work your part-time job or spend time with your family, whatever other commitments you might have. And then I'm just going to pop back onto the PowerPoint because um, there's a couple of shortcuts that I really like to use with Outlook. And so here they are, and Michelle will pop them into the chat for you. But the really neat one is this Control Shift N, which not a lot of people know about, but it creates a post-it note right when you're in your email. Maybe I'll just give you a quick little demonstration as I'm talking about it. So if I'm in here and I'm, ta I'm reading an email, and I'm like, oh, you know what? I really want to make a note about that. I can just write myself a note, send recording. And, and that will stay like a post-it. And then you can add to it, you can print from it. There's different ways to change colors to match different things in your outbox. But it's, it's another little thing that, again, can just make you more sufficient with your time. So these are other really great tools. Um, these are kind of the five top ones that I use and try to focus on. Blackboard, you all have access to Blackboard right now. Um, there's modules available for you to complete. And then if you do so, you get entered into a draw. I'm going to just play these tiny short videos. This one's just under two minutes. And this is about course view on Blackboard. And this will just help you understand what it looks like and the navigation of Blackboard for one of the first few times that you log in. And as your courses are uploaded, this will give you a bit of sense of, of how to navigate that. Original courses vary in design based on the instructor and the institution, but some common elements exist. Let's take a look. The course menu is the panel on the left side that contains the links to all top level course areas. Instructors can also provide links to the tools page, individual tools, websites, course items, and module pages. Instructors control the content and tools available on the course menu. By default, your original course includes a home page on the course menu. The default home page is a course module page that contains details about new content and due dates for the course you're in. Your instructor may rename or delete this page and choose which modules appear. The What's New module provides links to course content your instructor has added or changed in the last seven days. The content types reported in the module include tests and surveys, assignments, blogs, content, discussion posts, and course messages. Information in the What's New module updates the first time you log in for the day. Changes made after you log in don't appear in the module unless you select Refresh in the Actions menu. The To Do module provides a chronological listing of upcoming due dates. This module is divided into What's Past Due and What's Due. Use this information as the launching point for your daily coursework. In the My Announcements module, you'll see important time-sensitive information from your instructor. Recent announcements appear as links. Select an announcement or more announcements to view the complete list of course announcements. And finally, select tools in the course menu to access all the tools your instructor has made available to you. To view your grades, select the My Grades link on the tools page. So that's again just very quick about accessing your courses on Blackboard. These videos are all available to you through Blackboard as well as on YouTube. The second feature on Blackboard that I feel is most important is assignment overview. Courses vary in design based on the So we're going to pop over to assignments overview where if you're in the business administration or business courses you will have assignments due within the end of the first week, if not beginning of the second week, because you run on a seven week model. 
and that's just meaning that your courses are not as spread out as the other students are. You need to be um, a little bit quicker in terms of getting up to speed of how to submit assignments. So again, uh, this is about a minute and a half long. Assignments can be used for sim by submitting homework or participating in a back and forth review process with your instructor. Your instructor can add assignments to different areas of your course. You might access assignments from a link on the course menu called something like assignments. Or your instructor might incorporate assignments into the organization of the course. Ask your instructor if you have questions about how assignments in your course are organized. Alternatively, you can access assignments from the calendar. Assignment due dates are linked, so you can jump directly to your assignment. Your instructor may make some assignments available after a certain date or after you complete a certain task. For example, you might have to watch a lecture before you can access the assignment. Contact your instructor if you don't see an assignment that you think should be there. On the upload assignment page, review the instructions, due date, points possible, and download any files provided by your instructor. If your instructor has added a rubric for grading, you can view it here. Select Save Draft to save your work and continue later. Your text and files are saved on the page. When you return, you can resume working. Your instructor may allow you to submit an assignment more than once. For example, your instructor may provide comments on your first draft so that you can try to improve your work. If you may make another attempt, Start New appears on the Review Submission History page. When you submit your assignment, your instructor is notified automatically that your assignment has been resubmitted. And then the third one I'm going to talk to you about quickly is in addition to submitting your assignments, we actually use two systems to help teachers mark your assignments in relation to the originality. So when you're sourcing and you're doing research, um, we want to avoid having to, you know, they're remarking, you know, 40 or 50 papers to help avoid plagiarism. And so you're able to submit um, a draft to either turn it in or safe assign and get your originality report. And what it does is it's basing what you've submitted to sources and giving us a percentage of the originality. And then it rates it as medium, or sorry, low, medium, or high in terms of how how much of a match there is. It's a really great opportunity for faculty to help you and, and sort of discuss ways to source properly and or for you to get a, you know feedback on, on how you're doing in terms of interpreting the information that you've been researching. So this is a quick, I think it's just over a minute video about submitting a paper using Turnitin on the Blackboard platform. This tutorial demonstrates the procedure for submitting to a Turnitin assignment from the student perspective. From the folder where the Turnitin assignment is located, click View Complete underneath the assignment name. Click Submit. Notice that you can either choose to upload a file or cut and paste from an existing file. We'll choose Single File Upload and enter a title for the submission. Scroll down and browse to locate the file. Click Upload. This presents a confirmation page. Click Submit. And a digital receipt showing that you submitted the paper. To see the associated originality report, click on the Assignment Inbox tab. Here you can see the similarity index for your paper. Similarity index is based on how much matching text was found compared to the total number of words in the submission. Click on the similarity index to bring up the originality report. On the right hand side is the match overview. Turnitin uses an algorithm to find the best sources that match text within student papers. By clicking the little arrow, you can view a match breakdown. 
The match breakdown reveals any additional sources that overlap the same matching content contained within a selected match overview. Remember that Turnitin doesn't tell instructors whether a paper has been plagiarized or not. Originality reports are simply tools to help instructors locate potential sources of plagiarism or text which may have been incorrectly cited. Thank you for viewing this tutorial on submitting a paper to Turnitin. So I think it was really important at the end of the video where she quickly mentioned that it's it's not about determining if a paper has been plagiarized. It's about the risk of it and the originality. So it's again, it, it doesn't mean that um, you have to be scared that your paper is going to show up and you, you're going to get in trouble for being plagiarized. It's a communication that can happen between you and the instru instructor. You can also submit the draft and find out for yourself what it looks like before you submit it to them. I spoke earlier about using discussions and interacting with faculty and your classmates, and there's a, a portal on Blackboard that allows you to do that. And again, I've got a short video for you to view in terms of um, what that looks like. And let's see if I can get it going. Discussions allow you to share thoughts and ideas. Let's take a look. The main discussion board page provides a global view of all available forums. You can search for posts, see how many posts are in each forum, and jump to a collection of unread posts. Select a forum to view its threads. A thread includes an original post and all of its replies. Instructors and students, if they're allowed by the instructor, can create threads. Students do not see this button if the instructor has not allowed student thread creation for this form. Select an existing thread's title to view its posts and to reply to them. You can expand or collapse all posts. If you like to start with all posts collapsed, you can expand them one at a time. Point just below a post subject line and select expand. When you point to the thread page, the search and refresh buttons appear at the top. You'll want to refresh the thread page to see posts that were submitted since you accessed the page. The number of posts displays at the top of the thread. Selecting the unread number displays only unread posts. Expanded posts are marked as read automatically as you scroll down the page. Select the indicator to manually change the post's status. You can also flag posts that you want to review again later, or mark as important. To perform actions on a group of posts, Select the checkboxes and choose from the message actions menu at the top of the page. You can mark as read, flag, or collect posts to view them on one page and then filter or print the list. When you point to a post, the reply, quote, and email author functions appear. For instructors, the edit and delete functions are also available. Students can edit or delete their own posts only if the instructor has enabled those settings. Select reply to contribute to the discussion. The content editor allows you to format text, embed media, and attach files. A reply to the initial post appears at the bottom of the list. If you reply to a subsequent post, your post appears indented beneath the message you are replying to. Point to the age of the post to view its creation date and its number of views. And finally, if the instructor enabled the rating feature for the form, you can see the average rating for a post. When you point at the rating area, it changes to show your rating, where you can give the post a rating. Okay, so those are the few videos I have about Blackboard. If you have not logged into Blackboard at this point in time, I would encourage you to do that as soon as possible. One, to make sure that you have your login, you're able to get in, that you've got everything set up and downloaded. You can access this through slc.me, where it gives you all the options to email, to access your email or Blackboard and um, the internet and various other platforms. Right now we're using Teams as a tool to host this workshop, to communicate, and that might be a platform your faculty use. Not all teachers are gonna be doing the exact same thing the same way, and so, it's good to kind of be a little bit familiar with all of these different options in terms of, you know, what's best for whether it's the project, the, the course, um, the style of the teacher, 
And for us, we know this works really well for doing these online workshops because we have the we have options that we can record it, we can chat with you, you can come on to the camera if need be, and we can share our screen. So I'm going to give you a little overview. Um, again, it's by video of Teams, and I found it helpful, and I've been using Teams for the last couple of months, and there was a couple of things in this video that I learned that were new to me. So hopefully this will give you a good overview. Again, don't feel like you need to make a bunch of notes that you know, you're having to memorize all of these things. It's really just about knowing that these things exist that there's a tool there for you or when someone says okay let's meet via teams what that looks like whether you're studying at home or on the go Microsoft Teams for Education allows you to quickly connect with your classes, teachers, and friends using tools like video chat, audio call, and chatting from your mobile or desktop. Let's take a look. Start by opening the Teams app. To start a conversation with the entire class, select a team and a channel. Enter your message and send it. To send a private message to a single person or small group, select New Chat. Search for the name of the person or group. Select them. Enter your message. And send. When you receive a message, it arrives organized by date. And if it's important, you can pin it to the top of your chat list. To view a chat, select it. To reply, enter your message, then select Send. If you want to get someone's attention in a channel post, at mention them and choose them. When you're done with your message, select Send. To get the attention of the whole class, use at and the name of your class. Choose your class, write your message, and send it. To connect on video or audio, select chat. Search for the person you want to talk to. Select them. Then choose the video icon for a video chat or the call icon for a phone call. If your school has enabled it, you can also connect on the calls tab from the make a call or speed dial section. The Calls tab also allows you to view your call history, as well as your voicemail. Don't forget to express yourself by adding emoji, GIFs, memes, or stickers. And if someone calls you, answer it. With Microsoft Teams, you don't have to wait to ask questions, share, or just say hi. To study up on all things Microsoft Teams for education, Amanda. Amanda. Yes. When do, when do the recordings stories? normally come out? Uh, usually within the same day. So I can within send the same it. Day? Yeah. And does it get emailed out? Yes. I'll email okay. it out and we'll post it to our YouTube channel. Okay, perfect. Thank you. No problem. The last, um, we don't have too much time because my little technical difficulties, but I quickly wanted to talk to you about the URSLC app, which some of you are already using and accessing this workshop from. So it allows me to see who is signing up. It sends you reminders. You can access this from your phone, but if you don't have the app, you can actually log on through slc.me as well. And so just for a really quick overview of the different things you can use the app for, it does provide you like discussions for first year students. So right now it's showing me the workshops that are coming up today. Um, there's resources, first year questions. There's a sort of, you know, groups of things, a buy and sell, um, where I've seen lots of different textbooks for sale on there. People are also posting if they've got accommodations available. available. Um, and, and I've seen lots of great discussions around first year students just saying what program they're in, wanting to connect with other students, 
Um, obviously, they've got some other fun things on here and they do a lot of um, games. So I know on Tuesdays they do trivia. There's a lot of interaction. So the URSLC app is, is really important this year in terms of, you know, the alternate delivery, keeping you all together, being able to connect with you. Um, it's kind of a one stop shop. So that's all the time I'm going to spend on that. I will leave it up to you to investigate a little bit further. And before we wrap up, I just want to let you know if you need help with any of these services, where you can go. So IT um, is available. If you need to reset your password, you're going to email the slc.me. And then there's also a helpline for the URSLC app. Again, we'll send that out to you. <clears throat> In previous workshops, I've included this who to contact because as we get closer to school, we do find that the number of inquiries really does ramp up. And so if you can kind of get your answers now versus that first week, for one, you're gonna get a response much quicker and hopefully it won't set you back as much. So depending on what program you're in, you do have your own academic services assistant. You'll see that Kaylee is all of the programs and that Jenny is the business core. So the accounting, marketing, HR, general biz. If you're in the BBA, you have Kathy. Transfer credits have their own email and withdrawals. And then if you're just looking for general inquiries, program changes or name, course drops, if you're part, wanted to do part-time or fees, you're gonna email the general business one, okay? Is there any questions that we can answer today? I'm hoping that some of you will email us over the weekend with your signature and your questions or any feedback about today's workshop or even just to say hello so we can see that you've already sent your first email. Upcoming dates include the last workshop of our pre-arrival series, Navigating Schoolwork. Again, it will be this format on Teams. Sarah Durant, School of, or sorry, Student Success Facilitator will be facilitating that and also, the modules are already available on Blackboard for you to complete, and there's a little final quiz, and then you can be entered into the draw. Uh, question about, is office administration under BBA? No, office administration would be KLE, so you're your own separate program. And then the first day of classes is going to be September 9th, so watch your email in Blackboard. We will be starting to transition. Uh, healthcare is under KLE as well. So unless you're in the core, so that business, general, HR, marketing, or accounting, then, or um, BBA, you will talk to Kaylee. Uh, I keep getting emails to my Gmail. So right now we are emailing you at your Gmail. We will be transitioning over to your SLC email, and we will not be using personal emails. We potentially will send you from myself and the college, a few more between now and the first day of school and that's only to allow students who have not yet e like logged on to their email a chance to get into their SLC email but not miss the information. So I what well, after September 8th I will no longer be using personal emails it'll only be to your SLC email and faculty will often only respond to you if you've been emailing them from their SLC email. So you're encouraged to get that organized and get formatted there is a way to push the SLC email to your phone if you prefer that. And you can also amalgamate, you know, your personal email, Gmail or whatever with your SLC email. Um, healthcare, August 31st. Carrie, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I thought everything started on September 9th. Um, can I get back to you about the healthcare? Just, just to confirm, I'm going to say that it's probably not August 31st. Uh, class schedules, <laughs> Every, it's the hot question. Um, they will be available probably in about a week or so. Um, it, it comes down to a lot of numbers and um, we have a lot of students, so it, it takes a bit of time for that to happen. Uh, we will be able to take these on our own schedule. So, I, Caitlin, do you mean, are you going to be able to, um, like, will you have online times you have to sign in for. There will be some, but the majority of it will be on your own time. So that'll be a little bit about um, classes. Information about books. Uh, Michelle, can you answer that one? I know that you just looked that up this morning. 
Yes, so if you log into your slc.me account, at the very top beside home, you click on academics, and in the drop down menu, there's a something you can click on called book list slash learning. Um, I can't remember the full thing, sorry, uh, but it has the book list now. They can change, so I would keep checking back um, up until classes start. Um, sometimes it's best to wait until you receive an email from your teacher uh, confirming what books you need, uh, but it uh, depends on the teacher. Thank you so much. Um, Emily, yes. And accessing Microsoft 365, um, I thought you were able to do that already. Ash, have you tried and you're, you haven't been? Or you're just curious if you if you can. Do you know Michelle? So I believe that if you log into your slc.me, uh, in the top left corner there should be um, an overflow tab, and you should be able to download any of the uh, Microsoft programs through there. Perfect. I see Georgie had also responded that you're able to download it. Thank you so much for sharing that information, Georgie. Is there any other questions about the startup of school, technology, uh, anything we can help you with at this point in time? If please, after this video is over, certainly just send us a quick email. And someone's asking about where the previous videos are. They're actually on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and Google uh, SLC Biz, B-I-Z, or School of Business, St. Lawrence College, you will see our YouTube channel, which has our welcome video. It has your faculty saying hello. If you're in AMC or DMC or accounting, they have specific welcome videos where you can actually see all of your faculty. Um, it's just really nice to kind of get some faces to names already. Uh, student IDs. Oh, that's a very good question because typically we would use those for the bus. Um, I think that, you know, at this point in time, they're probably not, you know, super needed for anything, but it's good to have them so that you can, you know, you're not behind. They only offer them up for so long. Michelle, do you, ha did you use yours for the bookstore? I believe that might be somewhere else you have to use it. Sorry, um, I'm not sure if we had to use it for the bookstore because in person we don't. Okay. Um, but it might be something that you'll need. Um, if you have to fill out any forms or something, you'll need the number off of your student card, which you also have online. But um, I think going forward, it, if you're in Kingston, you might have to mm -hmm. present it to be able to get into the college is my assumption, especially yeah. during these times where they don't want to have too many people at the college. Yeah. No problem, James. And yes, the channel is SLC Biz, uh, no space for YouTube. I, I can send the link out or maybe Michelle can post it here in the chat for you. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I apologize again about the little technical glitch in the beginning, but uh, apparently it just wanted to put me through the test because that was our topic today. And really want to just say like congrats to all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to do this for yourself and to really have give you know Michelle and I someone to talk to for the morning workshop and you really are making a great decision coming to St. Lawrence and all of these little things that you do are going to just jumpstart your success when it comes to um, your courses your program and between now and the start of classes do not hesitate to reach out we have so many so many supports for students around time management self-motivation the technology piece and, and just courses in general. So you're very welcome. You're very welcome. And again, really great to have all of you on here. I'm, I'm really liking recognizing some of these names. And thank you, Michelle, for being uh, my assistant and backing up <laughs> when I disappeared. Have a really great weekend, everybody.